I know it's actually been like two weeks since the uh, the finale dropped, but this uh, this 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 over here this is the hot take couch, and I think it is important that I do this from the hot take couch, and you know that I am doing this with with minimum required effort because Assassination Nation is literally my favorite movie. And this, this just, this is just disappointing. Ah, oh, shit. Ugh. Oh. Mike. The worst thing about aging for me is not the fact that it is incredibly difficult as an adult to make friends or that my body is rapidly breaking down, but the fact that with each passing year, it becomes weirder that I love coming of age stories about high school girls. Although I am a shining beacon of masculinity and testosterone in this painfully low T environment, TikTok seems positive that I am a bisexual lady, and who am I to argue with the almighty algorithm? Like, my top four on Letterboxd are not necessarily my top four movies, but they, they make a clear statement. This man really likes ultra-stylized movies about teenage girls overcoming the odds that are also directed by men. And sure, I love more low-key movies like The Edge of Seventeen, Mustang, and even American Honey, but the only woman-directed movie that I can think of that has a vibe like those four is Raw. And my dislike of that movie's ending kind of outweighs the fact that it includes some of the best scenes of the last decade. Sorry. Point is, Euphoria, by its very nature, ticks a lot of boxes for me. I've never done drugs, which puts me a bit more at odds with the series protagonist than some others, but there are plenty of other characters for me to project onto, so it's fine. And in any case, it comes at a much different time in my life. When Joseph Kahn's detention took my number one slot from, I think, Requiem for a Dream back in 2012, I was just two years out from my high school graduation. And while serial killers and time-traveling body swaps may not have reflected my literal experience, it was fresh enough that I could feel how well the underlying drama matched that emotional one. Which is why I rolled my eyes at the negative reviews written by people who graduated from high school before the advent of the personal computer. What did they know about it? And now I'm a little bit that guy. I mean, what do I know about high school in 2022? I've got some relatively recent secondhand info from my college aged sister, but frankly, it doesn't matter because Euphoria clearly has no interest in capturing the high school experience. And I have seen some people complain about how unrealistic it is. But to them, I ask, do you really want this exact show to feel like it's taking place in an actual high school? Because I don't. I saw a video recently about why it's a problem to sexualize high schoolers as a concept, even when it is obvious that the performers themselves are well past that age. And like, yeah, no one who isn't also in high school should be thinking about a high school student like that, and, and this show sure does like making its audience think about the characters like that, and that's a problem if you're really thinking of them as 17 and 18 year olds, but credit where it's due, even if we, the audience, all know that these people are past college age at this point, the relative in-universe ages are treated appropriately. Like, that video I mentioned highlighted how often there are plot lines about students and teachers hooking up and how scandalous but sexy it is. And the one example of this in that show was the driving force between one of season two's major plot lines because it's a horrible fucking thing to do and in the show everyone understands that. There's no attempt to make illegal things glamorous or sexy, at least as they relate to that, even if the actors are made to be such. But if we're highlighting these early to mid-twenties bodies, you might ask, why not just set the damn thing in college? Yes. There would still be weekly think pieces about the social acceptability of what is now HBO's second highest rated show ever, I guess, but you wouldn't have that little feeling in the back of your mind like maybe they kind of have a point even when you know that they're fundamentally wrong. But then we get 
back to talking about this show and not some hypothetical similar show that might have existed and this show wouldn't work in college. It needs to be in high school for reasons that will force the forthcoming third season, which the rushed vibe of the second season makes me think actually came as a surprise, to be a rather different experience. While private schools throw a slight wrinkle into what I'm about to say, high school is really the last time that people from all walks of life are forced to genuinely interact with each other in the real world. The end of high school represents one of the most significant transitions in a person's life. Some people will continue their education and stay in the bubble for at least a little bit longer, while others will jump straight into what millennials have called adulting. There is a spectrum in that, obviously, but the key point as it relates to euphoria is that these girls will never be together again. You know that some of them will go to college and others won't. And those who do, they won't all be going to the same place. All of these characters' lives are pulling them in vastly different directions, but for now, they're together. And that is what high school is in Euphoria, a pretext for interaction, a forcibly shared space in which everyone can be their most dramatic selves because what other choice is there? Making it feel like high school by adding school drama and administrators wouldn't actually add anything of substance and would in fact take away from the interpersonal stuff that they're really focused on. Yeah, sure. An episode where Rue had a big test coming up, but she was so strung out and needed to figure out a way to cheat or something could be kind of fun in a self-contained way, but those are also some hella low stakes in a season where there's a threat of Rue being sold into sexual slavery. Then again, that kind of goes nowhere. At first, it seems like it will, but then in the back of your head, you're like, Zendaya wouldn't allow that in her contract, so uh, it's, it's going to work out in the end, and yeah. Yeah, sure, her escape from captivity is a very harrowing sequence, but it's ultimately kind of meaningless. It just gets dropped, because the show has other things it wants to focus on instead. And that is Euphoria Season 2's fundamental issue. It is too short for the stories that it's trying to tell. And there are two ways that could have been resolved. One, more episodes, where they could give all of these disparate plot threads the time that they needed to breathe, and, you know, fill in some of the gaps about other characters who we thought were going to be important and just kind of weren't. Or, two, cut out the wheel-spinning bullshit and focus on the right things. <laughs> and the easiest way to do that would have been to change the protagonist. This is still fundamentally Rue's show. She is the one who gets the voiceover to introduce and clarify characters. But she has long since stopped being the most interesting character. Hell, of the main set, she is definitely the least. There's a lot of work done to make Lexi more of a central character this season, but even when the show seems like it's Lexi's, or at least should be, it's still Rue's. And that's frustrating. But I do understand it. Like, Rue is the character who Sam Levinson really wants to tell us about because she's basically his self-insert. Levinson spent those years of his life in rehab. At the age of 16, he accepted that drugs would probably kill him, much in the same way that Rue seems to believe that. Addiction is everything. In TBH, Rue is the face of addiction, but also everyone's sort of an addict. Everyone gets caught in some sort of toxic cycle of something they just can't quit, though for them it's often more nebulous ideas like love or whatever passes for that when you're still a child. In Kat's case, our self-love icon reverting back to her insecurities, she decided that stability is bad, actually, and yada yada. I understand why Barbie Ferreira was unhappy with the way that her character arced this season. Sure, it was part of the whole make it really fucking dark thing, but I, I didn't like it. Yes, usually people are sad, but sometimes they're happy. Kat should have been happy. Anyways, Levinson was the subject of hundreds of think pieces over the past few months, and it is no surprise. I read the Assassination Nation script after shooting my uh, incredibly glowing video, and much like reading the Spring Breakers script, it's a really interesting look at how things got a lot less weird in a bad way, and a little more weird in a good way. Levinson's got this sort of maximalist style of writing where he just goes full-on bananas and then lets it get cut back as he goes because he's clearly not super precious 
about things. Every article I have ever seen, including the ones that are trying to call Levinson out as a creep, end up noting how much he prioritizes the comfort of his actors and gladly cuts things that they don't feel are in character or whatever. Yeah, Cassie was supposed to be more naked in the show, as were a lot of other people. And they said no, and he said, I, and wrote it out. Now, I understand that sometimes people don't feel comfortable speaking up for themselves, but I'm also quite confident that if that had happened on a Sam Levinson set, it would have been all over the dang place. So I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt here. Also, as I noted in my review of Assassination Nation, I think boobs are pretty cool, and I'm not going to complain if I see them more than is strictly necessary for my continued existence. And quite frankly, if you hear me complain about seeing them, I am almost definitely virtue signaling and you should unsubscribe from the channel immediately. I do respect that Levinson's response to critiques of the male gaze in season one were not to cut back on the boobs though, but to amp up the dicks. One of my colleagues came up to me the morning after one particularly penis-centric episode and said, I think you went overboard with that one. Why so many dicks? And I said, would you have felt the same way if it was a bunch of naked ladies? And he said, no, probably not. And I said, then it sounds like a you problem. And he said, maybe, but there still should have been less of them. And I don't, I don't know what to tell him. Like, at least they were beautifully lit, right? <laughs> Assassination Nation has a TikTok type of intensity, and Euphoria has pushed that style even further. This season goes to some truly wild places, and it is all lovingly captured on, honest to goodness, 35 millimeter film, which is, that's that HBO money right there, because like, are any other TV shows being shot on film? The Walking Dead was apparently shot on 16 millimeter for a while, but the pandemic shot stuff was done digitally. And anyway, 16 millimeter is a lot less expensive than 35. It is a wild thing to do. And, and I love it. And it really heightens the whole thing that film grain giving yet another texture to wrap your mind around while it throws all kinds of bonker shit at you. It's a lot. And I'm really into it. It's it's hyper pop the TV show. And to that point, when Lexi rode her bike to the sound of my most listened to song of 2021, she became my clear favorite of the main cast. And then like she turned her life into a hilariously high production value theatrical experience, which just, oh my God, goals. I loved that whole thing unequivocally, obviously. To be sure, the season's highs were really, really high, but there was so much that I found frustrating especially like the final minutes where everything just kind of gets wrapped up in a weird little bow. Yeah, plenty of threads are unresolved, but it happens in a way that still feels weirdly final. It reminded me a bit of Hannibal season three, which was clearly made by people who knew that they were getting canceled. And so they put two seasons worth of material into one. But that show did it so much more successfully because it didn't have the wheel spinning stuff. It breezed through scenes that I would have liked to linger on, but there wasn't any filler that I would have cut to extend them. They only showed us what was strictly necessary. So when the actual ending came and wrapped it up pretty dang quick, it was okay. But with Euphoria, I was genuinely surprised to learn when episode 8 came and that it was the last one because there was so much more to say and I didn't think there was enough time to say it. And I was right. And that sucks. And it does make me kind of excited about season three because a lot of these fundamentals aren't going to apply anymore because they will have graduated. I have no idea where it's even going to start, let alone where it's going to go. But for the love of God, dude, don't redeem Cal. 7.3 out of 10. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you particularly to my patrons, my mom, my cat, Kat Saracata, Benjamin Schiff, Anthony Cole, Elliot Fowler, Greg Lucina, Kojo, Phil Bates, Willow, I Am The Sword, Maddie Zimmerman, Claire Bear, Taylor Lindis, Andrew Madison Design, and the folks who'd rather be read than said. If you like this video, cool. If not, oh well. Uh, if you wanna see more, subscribe. It'll, it'll happen sometimes. I don't know, whatever, we're working on it.